The following is a conversation with Piotr Grudzień, co-founder of QuickChat. QuickChat is on a mission to create a conversational human-computer interface. Its fully conversational and multilingual AI assistants are powered by OpenAI's GPT-3. QuickChat chatbots can recognize and speak multiple languages. Businesses can use it to automate customer support, online applications, searching through internal knowledge base and other tasks. If you're interested in GPT-3, make sure to subscribe and check out our GPT-3 manual book for O'Reilly. This is Sandra and Shabam, and we hope you enjoy this interview. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to like tell us a little bit about how GPT-3 works uh, for QuickChat. Um, but uh, for starters, uh, and to give the viewers and the readers a little bit of more context about you guys, um, can you tell us like how the idea of QuickChat uh, come up? Uh, yeah, so when we, uh, when we first like, got access to GPT-3 and, um, and started playing with it, obviously like, uh, we've been following uh, the whole field of AI, machine learning, and NLP for for many many years, and uh, and the moment we got access to GPT three and started playing with it, like it became quite obvious that like now is um, now is going to be quite a different time uh, in a way, in a sense that uh, just the capability of the of these models is is completely different to what we knew before, and it was complete, and it was obvious that. Um, the use cases that now um, have become possible, um, there's there's just loads of them, um, but but still it wasn't like entirely clear from the from the beginning where uh, where we think uh, we might add the most value and where which uh, use case seems uh, the most exciting, um, but um, when we are using GPT three we uh, this idea kept on coming back to us this idea of um of these evolving interfaces between machines and and people so you know at the very beginning uh, it used to be that you had to write uh, you know machine code so almost like ones and zeros to communicate with a computer and then we created uh, you know c and then more and more inter interpret languages and then it appeared to us that gpt3 is this way of humans um to communicate with machines in the most natural way uh possible using using natural language because this most uh natural way for us to communicate is through conversation this is what we do since we're little kids and this is what we do throughout our lives with uh, with other people uh, and it occurred to us that like now is the time that this is this is going to become possible and we're going to be able to have a conversation um with a machine so uh, now that we know that uh, this is going to be possible like what can we do and um possibilities are are endless so from kind of mundane things like like customer support all the way to um you know immersive adventures and interactive games and interacting with uh, characters uh, through video and then like fulfilling a lot of different uh, tasks uh, on a computer using just uh, natural language like all of these things would become possible and what we um set about doing with quickchat is creating an engine that um, takes huge language models like GPT-3 and and all the other ones that that kept on uh, come, uh, popping up and creating something that makes it fairly easy for anyone to say, okay, I want to take this uh, conversation capability and then use it for my particular use case with this particular knowledge to fulfill this particular tasks, uh, and that's what uh, that's how it all started for us. That's that's really interesting. Awesome. That's really interesting. Yeah, I know. have a follow-up, like yeah. su super quick follow-up question. So, uh, basically, just just so I understand, was it that um, technologies such as GPT three, so so these large models, large language models with uh, large with uh, new capabilities, um, kind of inspired you to to create your uh, product, or was it that you were working on something? before and then gpd3 happened and sort of kind of fit the fit the picture for you or like changed your thinking about it how did that work 
Um, so, uh, so for us, it started with, with GPT-3. So we weren't working on QuickChat beforehand and that's where it started. Um, you know, this, maybe this general idea is, you know, one of many that we've had and discussed in the past, but, um, yeah, but, but it was inspired by GPT-3. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. That's great. So uh, the next question that I have is like, what, what led you to the use of OpenAI API and this idea of integrating it with an intelligent chatbot? Were you, have you uh, created a chatbot kind of company or product or solutions before you, before quick chat? And do you had the experience in a similar line before? And then you saw GP3 and thought like, it can be a good mix and match when you try to marry GP3 with chatbot experience. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would say, uh, in this particular case, uh, since we didn't have any, uh, so we didn't uh, work on chatbots before and we, um, didn't have this, I would, let's, let's call it a baggage of, uh, of all the typical procedures that you use for creating chatbots, like, you know, decision trees and, and particular scenarios and so on that, that kind of helped because we, uh, we had a um we had a very clear mind about what we what we want to do and we didn't have any preconceptions and we didn't maybe uh, know what was generally assumed to be impossible and we kind of started entirely from 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 scratch from a uh, blank paper to create a conversation experience that is as um human like and as impressive as possible um so 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 that was that was very exciting because uh, I feel like many chatbot implementations they start from um, you know being the best marketing tools possible or the best um, I don't know um, customer support tools uh, for this specific uh, use case. Whereas we uh, just started with okay, how do I um get a human being to talk to a machine in in such a way that it's like uh, completely impressive and and the best thing that they've ever tried and and we started off with that and then it turned out that kind of product ideas pop up um spontaneously out of that so um so that was that was super exciting and one of the uh one of one of examples where not having huge amount of experience in in a particular space uh was kind of helpful helpful because we were maybe slightly naive but then we kind of um tried all these all these new new ways and i think we we succeeded in making something very very interesting awesome so just following up on that was it like um you were experimenting with different use cases so you tried out different ideas and then like uh, found the chatbot um, uh, use case was the most exciting one for you, or uh, kind of how did uh, how did that process look like? I'm I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, that was that was probably a bit of that. Like GPT three is such a like a such a general purpose and fun tool that you know I I've had and still have like tens of different ideas uh, you could work on um we're we're focusing on that one but um but yeah there's there's so much you can try so um yeah so short answer is is yes thanks so um Piotr, can you tell us uh, now a little bit more about um your core products like what is quick chat offering at this point uh i know that you're experimenting with uh, with the the product offering and also with the marketing so uh we know of emerson AI, mm -hmm. for, for example, that is out there. Uh, could you tell us what Emerson is and also generally what's like the product offering from QuickChat at this point? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Emerson AI is probably the most uh, accessible part of what we do because it's literally um, a chatbot that anyone can talk to. And you can open Telegram or download our mobile app and talk to an AI and uh, hopefully be amazed by, by how uh, knowledgeable it is by how um, coherent the conversation are, but uh, are but how human-like they are, um, and uh, and there are a bunch of features that make the app um, uh, kind of fun to use. Uh, so um, you can speak in, in many different languages, which is useful for um, you know just practicing, but also you know me being Polish, I, I 
I find it way more fun to to speak in Polish rather than speak in, in English. Uh, so that's so that's pretty cool. And um, uh, Emerson is great for uh, brainstorming ideas. So if you're learning about a new subject, it's uh, it's great to kind of ask him question and and it's always going to point you in some interesting new research direction. So that's so that's always uh, fun. And uh, kind of week by week, we're adding some small new features that that our users keep discovering, and um, and that's and that's super fun because um, there's there's a big number of users that just enjoy using Emerson, but then um, there's a whole bunch of people who use it and get inspired, and then um, that leads them to our B two B product, which is um, a tool for you to create your own conversational AI for your own project. So um, in, the, in the simplest way uh, possible, what you get is a general purpose conversational AI that kind of similar to Emerson already has a general world knowledge and can already talk about any subject. But then we also allow you to add on top of what it already has some extra information that is specific to your product, to your project, or to any subject that you're interested in. So. Uh, one useful uh, way to think about it is uh, imagine you were to hire a person from a call center that that would um, you know answer question or, or work as customer support for your product. Um, so um, our B two B tool is uh, is kind of similar. So there's already this AI persona that can. Uh, talk about any general subject, but you can also give it some additional information. Say and say, uh, you know, whenever you ask about this specific thing, here is the information you need to answer. And obviously, because we're using um, really powerful AI technology, uh, there is no, you know, setting up of rigid scenarios. There is no question and answer. It's just you uh, copy paste um, text that contains all the information that you want your AI to be using. Uh, click on the retrain button, which takes a few seconds to in absorb the, the knowledge, and that's it. And immediately you can test your AI and see how you can talk to it, uh, and it's going to respond based on the information that, that you gave it. So uh, building on top of that, you said uh, quick chat was born after realizing cap capabilities of GB3. So once you have the proof of concept, like, have you have you ever experimented with other language models or techniques to, uh, apart from GPT, to build an AI assist, assistance uh, uh, experience that is similar to or at par with GPT three? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so like I said before, the like today there are many models that are uh, kind of similar to GPT three that are kind of worse at some things better than other things and we keep on experimenting with a lot of them and uh our chat engine has uh, like uses uses a number of different modules a number of different inputs and we keep on experimenting so whenever a new model comes up it's super interesting for us to try it and see what uh what are its strong sides what are its uh, weak sides and how we can improve on our chat engine using using that so yeah so it's great that so many people keep on working, keep on improving on the models. Um, so it's great for, for us to be able to to continuously um, improve our product. Well, just a follow up on that, like apart from GP3, do you use any other techniques or uh, maybe any other models to support the output that you show to the end user? Or is it just the raw input that goes to GP3 and the output that GP3 generates? Um, yes, we do use other models. It's not raw GPT-3. OK. OK, sounds good. Uh, so so uh, following up on that one, uh, we're always curious because um, it's kind of like a very unique situation for uh, developers where you have the, the powerful open source language models out there but you also have gpt3 that's like this model on steroids but at the same time um you're paying for for using the api so when you're saying you're you're using um a different different methods different techniques for quick chat uh, have you experienced any sort of like trade-off between using the open source um tech and uh, using the open ai api mm -hmm. 
Uh, oh yeah, definitely. So um, so some trade-offs are very obvious. So um, so the OpenAI API is is kind of nice and easy to use because you don't need to worry about infrastructure, about latency. Um, it's you know it's just calling an API and getting an answer. It's super reliable, uh, but you do pay for it, right? So there's the variable cost of of API calls. Um, open source models are great, like in in theory, because in theory you can just pick them up and use them for free. In practice, um, you do need uh, you do need to pay the uh, the cost of uh, of cloud computing. Uh, it requires GPUs and you know setting up GPUs to work with these models to uh, to be uh, fast, then to do fine tuning of your own and so on. Like that's not uh, trivial. Um, so not probably not anyone can do it. Um, so you like you need to learn how to do it. So um, and obviously um, even in terms of like raw parameter numbers numbers, those models uh, have fewer parameters than GPT three uh, as of as of today at least. Um, so yeah, so I, I would say these are kind of typical um, technology uh, trade offs. So you can always do something in house and have more control and ultimately save money. Um, but you need to bring in you know, talent and you need to bring in extra resources to actually maintain it. Um, and then the other option is to outsource it and, and use a, a technology vendor and then you pay extra, but, um, but you have like no, no problems at all. And, uh, and, you, can, and, and you can just um, use the, the technology that is maintained by someone else. Uh, and I think a useful uh, way to think about it is that whenever there's a technology that you want to uh, innovate on and that is crucial to your product, I would recommend moving it in-house uh, so that you have full control so that you uh, you can always tweak it. But if there's something that you can use kind of like a commodity technology and, and, and it doesn't really matter, um, how well it performs, or at least it's not crucial to your product, then using a vendor probably makes makes sense because you uh, like, for example, these days everyone uses AWS or Google Cloud because like it's just not worth it to keep your own servers. Yep, that that quickly. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, so, Piotr, how how was your journey of building Quick Chat? Uh, as a GP3 based startup, and if you can describe in words like what are the things that worked out in your favor, favor because you were using GP3, and what were the challenges that you faced uh, while creating a product on top of GP3, maybe integrating it with the different kind of tax stacks. So if you can describe your journey of the mm -hmm. strengths and the weaknesses because of using using GP3, or the things that work, worked out in your favor and the things that posed as challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so um, so obviously uh, GPT three uh, was and and still is uh, you know a big uh, topic in in the tech world. So uh, if you're using kind of a, a trendy technology like that, you're likely to uh, be okay in terms of like top of the funnel. So a lot of people want to try out your product, and a lot of people are excited about it. So that's uh, so that's always a great thing. But but apart from that, I would say that. Whether you're using GP3 or not, um, like the basic principles of what makes your startup work are kind of the same for everyone. So at the end of the day, um, yeah, no one's going to use your product just because it's GP3. It needs to be, uh, it, it needs to deliver some value, you know, so either be useful or be fun or solve some problem. Um, so yeah, and, and at the end of the day, that's all you spend your time on. Um, and uh, and GPT three like it's not gonna do that for you. So you need to uh, just treat it as as yet another tool that you use to stitch get stitch together with other tools and and deliver something that uh, that actually uh, gives people value or gives people value that's more on the B two B side and then maybe it's like fun or educational or um, or empowering to a user that's on the on the consumer side. So. Um, so maybe that's that's something that, uh, that that might be a mistake that some people have made that they assume that you know uh, just because they use GPT three that's gonna give them a profitable product. But uh, you know, um, 
again, people are going to be excited about anything GPT-3 for, for a few weeks, but then, um, you know, people get, get bored and wait for the next big thing. And then uh, the only product that survive is ones that actually solve something, solve some problem that people care about. Got it. So um, I'm curious because uh, on the on the one hand, there is um, like most of the stuff that you need to solve while while building and scaling a product is just like like typical textbook startup stuff. But on the other hand, you are dealing with this new technology that is being delivered with in this new type of way and i'm curious if uh, having been through this journey already you're like this seasoned gpt3 powered entrepreneur let's let's put it that way um if you were uh, identify maybe like some key key like words of advice for somebody that's starting from scratch and thinking of using this engine for something uh what would that be um Okay, so maybe, yeah, maybe something that, that is worth remembering is that um, whenever you're building a machine learning product, like it's, um, it's always tricky to evaluate machine learning products um, because um, the way ML metrics work is that it's super easy to kind of be lying, lying to yourself or to even accidentally even accidentally measure your product's performance um, in a way that it that looks way more than it is in in, in the reality. And I'd say because GPT three is so um, uh, is so is so powerful and um, and operates in this domain of natural language uh, that is difficult to to quantify. Um, that makes the problem even worse. So. Um, Whenever, let's say you've built some sort of a product using GPT-3. So that means that the product takes some sort of text input and then gives some sort of text output. And, and then in order for you to succeed, you have to be able to quantify and put in numbers how well your product does. Uh, and that's always going to be very, very tricky because with GPT-3, it's always tempting to, um, to try something. Uh, if it doesn't work, try again. And then like within two or three tries, you're gonna find, get something amazing. And then, uh, and then you're gonna assume that like, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's success. But then when you, when you actually deliver it to users, like users are gonna probably judge you on your worst case performance uh, at best at your, on your average performance. So, so that means that really the cherry picked uh, best examples, they're good for marketing, but they're not good for actually measuring your progress um uh, again what i what i've seen a lot is that um is that uh, you know trying to optimize for the best case scenario uh, makes you suffer in the average case scenario because it's yeah it's like if you're optimizing one thing and forgetting about the other it's like it's always going to make it worse so uh so the really really difficult part is to try and uh, design a metric that really really captures what what correlates with you know your users being happy um you having high retention which eventually translates into revenue so i would say that's the that's the very tricky tricky part because um yeah because gpt3 just outputs text and 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 it's difficult to evaluate the quality of text okay that's that's interesting and like um kind of um drawing from your experience of of uh, this b2b uh, service for companies building chatbots if somebody was more interested like in this in this chatbot area are there uh, any particular you know trends that you have seen maybe that are that are worth uh, pointing out um for others because i like uh, one thing is that i participate in a lot of hackathons that are uh, with with the team of gpt3 and a lot of guys are uh, developing different types of chatbots uh, with like different different purposes. At the same time, when you look at uh, how the uh, this like baby market of of GPT three based products evolved, you are one of the um, most recognized uh, startups in this area, and there aren't many like uh, you know like super um, like super obviously successful ones. So I can imagine it must be quite tough to actually 
take the capabilities of GPT-3 and turn it into an amazing uh, chatbot product. So um, would you would you say anything about that specifically? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the, and the reason for that is very obvious and something that we struggle with every day. And that's, um, you know, GPT-3 feels kind of optimized for creativity. You know, even if you set temperature very low, like it's still, um, whatever prompt you give it, it's still gonna use that prompt that is tiny and then generate something based on this vast, vast, vast knowledge that it has, which is amazing for, you know, write, writing poetry or, you know, creating some real fun, um, I don't know, interview or, or story that's, uh, that's, you know, cherry picked out of 10 different tries, but to really create a chatbot that solves a problem, it needs to be um, accurate. It needs to uh, have, you know, predictable, repetitive performance and while still being kind of conversational and to some extent creative, but not uh, pushing it too far. Uh, and I think that's the that's the really tricky part, and that's um, that's the thing that uh, we hope that we manage to solve and um, and improve on in the future. Um, but but yeah, I would say I would say that's the that's the really tricky part. You know, with GPT three, it's it feels very easy to create something that to to very quickly create something that kind of already is a chatbot and if you just talk to it it's gonna talk back and and it feels like you achieved something but actually uh, then going back to my previous point if you start measuring if its performance if you start measuring like whether it managed to to satisfy some condition or fulfill a task then then it's gonna turn out that you know it's really really creative but you know out of 10 tries it only succeeded you know six times which is uh, you know, as good as zero when it comes to, you know, real business paying customers. So, so that's the tricky part. You need a lot of technology and restraints and models on top to really, um, to really make it reliable. Thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Pricing is a crucial part of any business that we see, right? Uh, and GV3 being one of the model that offers model as a service uh, and charges on per API call. How how does the pricing of GB3 works for your business where you have a solution where you have a B2B solution where you allow people to build their own chatbots using the framework that you have created? So how does the pricing works uh, for quick chat? Yeah, so um so you know GPT3 as a as a machine learning model available via API in charge per call. Like you would say that it is relatively expensive, so compared to anything that happened before. Obviously, you pay for the quality, but but still, but still, it's relatively expensive. So, uh, yeah. So if you're building a business on top of it, that's that's an extra um, consideration that you need to take into account. Um, uh, but I, but I think that's fair enough because you know th it's it's great technology and it's and it makes you think about you know unit economics and really delivering value from day one. Uh, because you just can't afford to let people use it and and um, and uh, and not care to pay for it. You know, naturally, because uh, GPT three used to be the only model out there. Now there are more uh, coming up. It is uh, quite expected that pricing will go down or or will plateau to some uh, to some level, uh, just because of you know the pressure of competition. Um, which is which is kind of natural whenever competition arises um but uh you know for us we um like it was never never a huge blocker because like we uh, like our number one goal was to create a product that delivers a huge amount of value to to our user right and then if uh, we need to pay something per message to open ai we need to make sure that we uh, deliver value to the user that is also per message and that we do our kind of financial modeling uh, correctly so that um you know we can um we can get our our share but also our customers can make money and we we pay to open ai and we uh we we get our margin as well so um so obviously obviously if all the models were cheaper we would be happy but uh, but the current pricing you know makes you be makes you rigorous about, um, you know, your unit economics and so on. That makes sense. 
Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'm curious as well. Um, I'm not sure if you can mention that, but it would be it would be interesting to understand uh, in what way the your customers are using the chatbots for. So is it like can you sort of like predict what will be the what will be their usage, uh, you know, on their end, or is it like they are interacting with the world and uh, you know we have some spikes and then it goes down. Is it, is it more of internal uh, like messaging systems or is it more of an interaction with the world that they, that they use it for? Um, so honestly, we've, uh, we've seen like a huge number of very diverse applications. So I'd say like each one of, of the ones that you described, we like we've seen a number of times. Mm. So, so yeah, there are some that there are some, some that are very very typical which is just solving the usual faq customer support problem so i have an faq but my user users um don't really want to read through the faq they just want to uh, to ask a question and get and immediately get an answer uh, and um, you know today companies need to hire people to just answer the same questions over and over again and this is something that we can automate so so that's a that's a kind of a typical one um but um but obviously, this use case can also be uh, implemented internally for your knowledge base in your company. Uh, so you can think of it as as super smart search. Uh, but again, search is kind of uh, kind of boring and not non interactive. Whereas what we deliver is is kind of this this persona that has all this knowledge and can um, can just answer a question or have a conversation about a particular topic. Um, and obviously, uh, because um, uh, these these new language models are so creative, there are some use cases that are quite new and super exciting. So um, we can definitely see this being uh, applied to, you know, computer games or creating, um, you know, virtual characters or, um, you know, um, as as I mentioned before, um, this interaction between uh, humans and computers um you we could potentially start even treating internet as a completely different medium you know these days why is it that that still all websites are are, are static and you have to click and stuff why wouldn't there be a persona or on every website that can um deliver all the content that the website has in a conversation manner so um so the possibilities are endless and i think with the current trends that we see with you know multiverse and and all these um all, all these um, movements of like uh, move, moving uh, stuff from the physical world into the virtual world. I think there's yeah there's there's loads and loads of uh, interesting uh, applications that that we're gonna see. Thank you. Um, so, um, do you feel like uh, having uh, GPT-3 as the uh, key engine gives you competitive edge over um, services that you know, provide chatbots like B two B chatbot um, uh, products, uh, but don't use it. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'd say that that's um, that would be uh, one of one of our main kind of um, uh, added value points. Um, that that yeah, we can deliver a chatbot solution that is kind of end to end. Um, that that works. Uh, let's say, um, okay. So let's take an example of, of a traditional chatbot that where where you set up a decision tree that is kind of a path that the conversation uh, can take. Um, so um, this is not very conversational, but if you treat it as a you know as a, a contact form that is turned into a, into a chatbot, then it, this is pretty useful because it feels like a conversation. It's natural, and at the end of the day, you get your entry into your into your CRM. Um, but it is not a conversational chatbot. It's not really, really a conversation. So uh, while we can deliver a solution like that as well, uh, like we think um, each solution like that lacks this uh, conversational part. So, um, so using our, for example, uh, using our API, you could plug our API into a solution like that. And then what you get is, uh, the chatbot still um, completes its function, which is very, very uh, simple. Just uh, you know, uh, just collecting name, surname, uh, email address, 
But whenever the user wants to ask a different question or maybe have a casual casual chat, then suddenly it turns out that the chatbot, you know, it's almost like a person that you can have small talk with. Um, so, so in in this sense, um, not only could this be a replacement of of some old chatbot technology, but even in some fair way a an enhancement as something that those chatbots are missing that could be plugged in in the simplest way possible. You know, whenever when these days, you know, it feels like these chatbots nine out of ten times they're going to say I, I don't know. So instead of saying I don't know, they could fall back on on the conversational API like ours and and just you know keep the conversation going and and avoid this you know huge frustration of just just getting I don't knows all the time. Great, thank you. So do you do you actively collaborate with OpenAI to improve the API response? And does OpenAI provide any kind of support or maybe help with the prompt engineering to its frequent customers, to its large large customer base like you, who has been uh, using the API very frequently and for such a long duration of time? So do they come into picture at any point of time to help you oh, re-engineer the response that you're getting from the prompt and um, make it tweak, help you to tweak the prompt in a certain way that will give you more favorable responses for, for the application that you're building. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, so over time we've had, you know, a lot of interactions with the, with the OpenAI open team. Um, you know, they're super responsive, especially, um, you know, since we've been collaborating for a long time, so that's been super useful. Um, yeah, they've given us a lot of tips on on how to uh, make things wor work better. Um, so that's that's really been great. And uh, yeah, and I feel like early on we've also given some feedback. Uh, so it was a bit of a, a bit of a back and forth when they would suggest something, and we would give give some feedback that that was hopefully useful for them internally. Um, uh, now I would imagine it's it's a bit more tricky because there are loads of people using GPT three. So, uh, so I would imagine they have probably like a hundred times more, um, you know, conversations, teams, requests than in the early days. So it's probably different uh, now. They they probably had to implement some um, more internal processes, uh, etc. But uh, but yeah, it's it's always been it's always been super useful, and I feel like. Um, they were really like receptive to any sort of feedback, any sort of uh, suggestions. So it did feel like, um, you know, they did treat those early users as just, you know, guidance, uh, as, as in like we give you this tool and you guys tell us how to improve it. So that was that was really really great. Yeah, that sounds really great. Um, so um, you mentioned that the performance of the API was uh, awesome so far, uh, but we were always curious if there were some exceptions. Uh, have you experienced any um, any downtime or any bugs uh, in the API uh, while using it so far? Um, so in terms of downtime, uh, I think I think everyone who's using it, like it does occasionally happen that, that the request would air out, but then but then um, you have the mechanism of of retrying, so so that's that's not not a huge issue. Um, so obviously there are some some shortcomings that are um, kind of inherent to big language models, inherent to GPT three, um, and that's um, th that's actually one of the one of the added value points that we have. So we we try and solve quite a quite a lot of these problems. So that's why. Um, and that's why uh, quite a few of, of our users who kind of assume that uh, Emerson or our products or, or our API is just, you know, is just GPT-3. And then they're quite surprised how, um, you know, using our API, they, don't, they never get any kind of weird answers. They never get any empty answers uh, and so on. So, we, um, so we've solved a number of, of these problems for us. Um, and by, and by solve, I mean kind of what I described before is that you know for like GP3 works great and most of the time it works great, but it does occasionally happen that that you need to um, yeah take care of the the out because the output is isn't great. So uh, enable to kind of in order to create um, this tool for our customers that that really works 
um, you know, ninety nine percent of the time, um, we uh, yeah we developed a number of these different mechanisms to make sure that like things sort of never never go wrong. Um, uh, but but yeah, just just kind of by nature of these large models, there will be some behaviors that. Uh, that you need to be aware of. Um, I'm not sure if I would call it bugs, but um, that, you know, it's it's machine learning. So machine learning is is never perfect. It's just you are just like somewhere on the um, you know false positive, false negative um, uh, spectrum, and you need to work around it. Like it's never going to be perfect. That that sounds very reasonable. Um, yeah, that's something that can happen with this kind of model with this size. So towards the end, taking a philosophical turn towards the end, and uh, I would like to ask you this question that QuickChat has been very successful and already set a trend uh, in the industry when you talk about intelligent chatbot experience. But if you have to do it again, well, would you do anything differently? Hmm. That's a good question. Um... Yeah, definitely. Let's like so. The obvious thing is, you know, whenever you launch something, you um, like later on, it, it always feels like you should have done it earlier, and that's uh, and that's definitely the case. I know that like uh, with OpenAI, we always um, went through the approval process and so on. So there are some restrictions, but still, like like we could have done things uh, faster uh, because uh, again, like I said before. Um, you only le really learn what you need to do when when you have real users using your product, and uh, and and only then once you launch, you actually start um, doing the real work of um, um, of yeah optimizing it, trying to uh, trying to make it better. So um, yeah, so always launch as fast as fast as possible. Um, let's see what else. Um, yeah, uh, again, probably a bit of a kind of general advice for startup founders. So, um, you know, use your, use your product. That's, I would say that's, that's, that's pretty surprising how few startup founders actually use their products as in, like go in their users shoes and, you know, do the clicking and the creating an account and going through payments and so on. Um, it it has happened to us, and I'm sure it has happened to many other people that you know they had to uh, do something using their own product, and they were shocked by you know what it feels like, you know, finding bugs, how slow it is, and so on. So, um, so that's a mistake that we've done in the past, and I I do recommend people just like continuously using their product, um, and yeah, and uh, and and measure measure things. Uh, again, alluding to what I said before, with GPT three, it's it's easy to uh, you know get a few amazing responses and feel really good about yourself. Um, and then um, you you don't really know what it looks like when when the users are interacting with it. So uh, so find a good metric, um, find a metric that that makes sure you don't uh, you don't cheat and make sure your objective. Uh, and make sure that you don't get kind of too optimistic about the best case scenario, but you know always always uh, measure um, the real real uh, performance, and yeah, and uh, and kind of iterate on it over and over again. Always keep measuring and um, yeah, and um, and the improving and the improvement process like never ends really. So so like for us today, it's nowhere near a finished product and and the improvement cycles keep on going yeah that is that is a really great retrospective of your journey and some very good advice for the budding entrepreneurs and founders who want to use gp3 so before we wrap up just the last question for you uh where, where do you see quick chat going forward are you focused towards building a more immersive chatbot experience maybe a uh, video chatbot experience or something else that you have in the pipeline that you want to share with us? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of, um, yeah, video experiences, um, so our mobile app uh, does give you, um, 
there is the feature to talk to Emerson uh, using voice and audio. So that's something you can do using app. Uh, in terms of avatars and video, like that's not something we're currently working on. Um, so again, uh, any any of, of our B two B users who are interested in um, building something like that, they're more than welcome to uh, you know take our API and integrate it with some uh, video software, with some avatar, with some um, um, animated simulation. So that's another really cool, interesting idea. Uh, it's probably something we're not gonna uh, be working on in house for the time being. Um, uh, in terms of any big uh, launches, like we're going to be launching uh, our Android app soon, so um, that's probably not hugely exciting unless you, uh, you know, you don't have an iPhone and you don't have Telegram and you you couldn't try uh, Emerson. Um, so uh, so that's going to be a pretty uh, good milestone for us. Um, but apart from that, yeah, we're we're focusing really on the. Uh, on, on working um, deep with our with our customers on particular use cases and really making sure that uh, the the API performs really, really well for their particular products and helping them succeed. So that's that's kind of the most important thing for us. Um, Emerson is super cool as a marketing tool uh, right now, and there's a lot of um, you know very happy users. But uh, we really really want to see um, our chat engine being used in uh, hundreds hundreds of different ways in different products. And uh, and that's what we're really, really excited about to see uh, what people can build using it. Yep, that, that sounds really inter uh, exciting. And we, we look forward to having all these use cases and the new features that Richard has gone a lot launch in the coming time. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for sharing uh, your journey with us, Piotr, once again. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess we can wrap up. I think I think we have a lot of good good stuff in here. So thanks again. Once, Thank you so uh, much for your more. time. Cool. And, yeah, uh, it was a, it was fun. It was a pleasure to talk and and always useful to ask um, yourself these questions and force yourself to formulate answer, answers because it's really like. Makes you and, uh, take a step back and yeah. think about what you're doing. Yeah.